Okay, everybody, we are beginning the 23rd Perek of uh, Masechet Shabbat. This is the longest Masechet in words. Um, uh, Daf uh, Kof Mem Chet. Mishnah begins, Shoel Adam Mechabero Kadei Yain Kadei Shemen Belbad Shelo Yomar Lo Halveni. All right, so this stuff is going to be talking about um, doing business transactions, uh, lo- lending, borrowing on Shabbat. This is not one of the 39 melachot. Uh, kind of surprising because, you know, when we think about business, that's a lot of what we do uh, uh, as, as merchants, as importers. Uh, but it's not one of the 39. Uh, in, instead, you know, we derive it from Yeshayah, Dabar, Davar, uh, speaking about business, going about one's ways, and the only way it's connected to the third Amalachot is as a gezera that you may come to write. If you're doing a business transaction, you're going to write a receipt, you're going to uh, write up a bill of sale, and so that's, that is the main problem. And so we see that right here, um, that a person can borrow uh, jugs of wine and jugs of oil for someone else on Shabbat, but it depends on the language. You can say, can I borrow in the, in the sen- in sense of uh, but don't say halveni. Halveni is a more official term at, and, uh, that implies that you're going to, it's going to be a long-term uh, borrowing and it's, uh, you're going to have to write up some terms. A woman can borrow bread, loaves of bread from her neighbor. Since you cannot write up any terms or anything, uh, if you don't trust the other person, then the other person can say, hey, I'm going to, you mind if I leave my clothing here? Um, and that will be, you can't say it's going to be a collateral. But, every, you know, uh, everybody understands what's going on here. Uh, and then after Shabbat, then you write up the, the details of it. Uh, okay, so we'll see more about this language. Uh, sometimes it happened, and it doesn't happen in our calendar, but in, uh, in an empirical calendar, uh, it could be that uh, you have to do, let's say, Seder night would be Saturday night. That means uh, during the time of Beta Mikdash, they'd be preparing for Ban Pesach on, for, on, on Shabbat. Sorry, on, yeah, on Shabbat itself. Um, so let's say I didn't get a chance to join in. Right? Everybody has to be part of Korban Pesach. You have to join in to a group. Uh, and, you know, you have to give the money or something and, or say, you know, I'm, I'm part of your group. Uh, so it says, um, uh, if you want to join in, you can leave your clothing there as a kind of collateral that you'll pay for after. And that shows that you are joining in the group for Korban Pesach. And after Yom Tov, then you say, oh, how much is that worth? Good. So that's one of the, that's one of the differences. What, what exactly is it borrowing? Usually if you're borrowing uh, an item and you're uh, not returning the same wine, uh, which is like money in that sense, right? Different from a, a, you know, a lawnmower, where I'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna use it and give it back to you. So they, yes, that could make a difference between the type of loan. Usually if I'm giving back the same thing, I'm using, you can use it for a short time, then give it back. Whereas like money, it's for a long time. You're not giving back Koban Pesach, you're giving back money. Right, right. And so they're, just, they're more more official than, uh, than you know, can I borrow that, that knife for a second? Um, okay. more of a transaction. Right. Oh, exactly, uh, exactly. It's more of a, right, that's why it makes it more worse, more complicated. Uh, these are things that you uh, may may want to write up. What's the difference between these two, two terms? It's hard to translate this into English because we say borrow and, and loan, and this interchangeably. Maybe it's something like, you know, can I use that thing? Uh, you know, that then you're just using it for a short for a short time. Uh, you know, whereas uh, uh, lend uh, sounds like it's more official. But in Hebrew, they have these the, the differences. And so Halveni, since it sounds like a longer term, more official person will come may come to write. So don't use that language on Shabbat. Okay. Could it be that, yeah. that uh, it's coming from like Shoel? Like, uh, can I ask of you to take? Yes. 
Yes, right. It's the same. Yeah, Shoel is it could be asking for information, and in this case, asking for an item. It's more casual. We have a problem with this language because during the week, even in Hebrew, people are not so uh, 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 so intentional to to say one or the other. Sometimes they say hashileni, and really they mean halveni. Right? The the terms are synonymous even in Hebrew. Uh, and so since during the week you might say hashileni, but you really mean halveni and you might come to write. So to on Shabbat, perhaps we should say, you, you can't even use the language of hashileni because during the week you mean by that halveni and also you will come to write even if you only say hashileni. Ah, it's, just, it's, it's different. The context is different when, when you say it. During the week, since it doesn't matter which one you say, um, and because people don't are not uh, careful with this language, then during the week, even if you say Hashileni, you may come to write. But Shabbat, everybody knows the laws of Shabbat. So the person will recognize, oh, he said, he said hashileni, he was precise in his language, because everybody knows that only that's allowed on Shabbat. And so if he's saying it in that way, he means that it'll be an unofficial transaction. No, I think, oh, no, this is, they're aware that language means different things in different contexts. So, did they just, it sounds like they just lost the formality of one, one to the other and differentiation. One to so other people, one. people speak more formally in some contexts and less formally in yeah, other so contexts. Years, right? Yeah. And the, uh -huh. Right. Boundaries. Yeah. Okay. It could be that the word, the word, uh, the uses of use of wording change, but I don't think it's that. And they're not speaking Hebrew. They're also not speaking Hebrew. They're speaking right. Aramaic. Right. 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 Okay. So I, it, we could look at how these these terms are used throughout Mishnah, throughout Talmud Perik, what the Aramaic equivalents are, and then what would the halacha be if you're speaking English, right? And the poskim do talk about that. So there should be some different language, you know, and perhaps it's just some indication that you know, oh, Shabbat today, you know, but uh, can I, uh, you know, can I use that hat? Uh, something like that. So there should be some some way of distinguishing that uh, you don't mean this as an official transaction. All right. Yeah. Okay. This is, does not have to do with the previous, except that said by the same sage. Bar Hana, let me see, right? The first one is also a question, a statement that he said to Abaye, a question. Uh, so this is the second one. Um, so the rabbis say, anything that you do on Yom Tov, um, that even though you're allowed to do it, to prepare food or whatever, but if you can do it in a different way than usual, it's better to do it in a different way. That way it will remind you that it's a holiday. The women who go and draw water from the well, uh, the cistern, why don't they do it in a different way than usual? Um, this, you know, involves carrying and um, perhaps other things, so they, they should do it in a different way. The answer is, there is no other way to draw water. What do you want them to do? If they usually use a big jug, you want them now to use a small jug? Then they're going to have to be making more trips and walking more. So that's more work. That's not better for Yom Tov. If they usually use a small pitcher and you say, oh, go use a big pitcher, but then it's very heavy for them. Probably they're using a pitcher that's just right for them. It's the least work during the week. So if you do anything different, it's going to be more work for Yom Tov. So that's not good. If you say they should put a cloth on top of the vessel, well, then the cloth is going to get wet, and then they may come to squeeze it out. I like how the pedic, this pedic links to the previous pedic. If you say they should cover with a lid, uh, sometimes the lid will fall off, and then you're going to come to tie it on. So you see, there is no other way to do it. So, you know, we're not going to make people go out of the way to do it a different way. 
this ends up going to be that that's going to be worse or lead to something that possibly could be worse. So this is the third statement that these rabbis said, one said to, to the other. As quoting from Mishnah and Betzah, that on Yom Tov, you cannot clap hands, uh, clap your, against your, your thigh, or a dance, uh, you know, stomping. All these things are uh, called Shavut and the Mishnah. Um, these are and the Mishnah itself, and then in, uh, in the in the Tanaitic Midrashim, they are categorized as the Oraita laws. But we'll see here that Bavli recategorizes them as laws that are midrabanan, because right? you might, if you start dancing or clapping to a beat, you may come to play an instrument. Uh, the original context is probably not playing an instrument, but rather making a lot of noise. And Shabbat should be a quiet time. And the question is, Mishnah, although Mishnah says you should not do this, we see people doing this on Shabbat. It seems like this was a common custom. People would go around and be dancing and, and clapping on, on Shabbat and having a joyous day. And the rabbis don't say anything about it. So when the Ta'amich, so his Rabbi has responses, I'll give you yet another example. How does that, how does that answer the question? Okay, it just makes it even more, even more pressing. Okay, anyway, uh, uh, that there's a halacha that you should not sit right at the entryway of the alleys. Uh, because it shouldn't sit right, at, right, right where the alleyway opens up to the Shut HaRabim, because then if something rolls out, uh, then the person sitting there is going to go and stand up and bring it in, because it's not so noticeable. It's not like uh, s sitting at your porch door where you, it's clear where inside and outside is, and you're not going to bring something in. Here it's all open. There's just uh, you know, a rod that's, uh, that's showing the, the, the demarcation. So don't do that, because then you might come to carry. And yet, Go out and look, and you'll see. So lots of people sitting right there at the threshold, and the rabbis don't say anything. So why don't they say anything in that case? Ella, I'll answer both. Hanach Israel, mutab sheyehu shogigin ba'al yehu mezidin. Leave Israel alone. Better that they should do it by mistake than that they should do it on purpose. In other words, if you go and tell them, hey, dancing is not, and clapping is not allowed on Shabbat, they're going to do it anyway, because that's, uh, that's how they spend their time. It's not going to be able to stop them. And now they know it's prohibited because uh, you warned them. So better not to tell them since they're not going to listen anyway. And that way they will only violate unwittingly, not on purpose. It's a very important principle. Um, okay, based on what I said uh, just a few minutes ago that in the Tanaitic layer, these actually actually are the oraita. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, right, we, uh, we at first we assumed that we only apply this principle regarding a law that's but not if it was if it were the oraita, if people are going uh, eating pig, uh, they're murdering people, whatever. You don't say, oh, they're not gonna stop anyway, let them keep doing it, right? It doesn't matter, even if they're not gonna stop, you gotta warn them if it's something that's the oraita. All right, so at this stage, it's interesting because actually historically in the early layer of the Tanaim, as Ramban says even, right, these were, these were considered Oraita. So which means uh, you would have to stop them. It's a practical difference uh, by recategorizing them as, as to the banan, as Gezerot, that you might come flip to play an instrument. Okay, but anyway, in the end of this Gemara, that won't matter. Because after all, adding some time to Yom Kippur, right? You're supposed to add a few minutes uh, before Yom Kippur. Don't eat right to the right to the last minute, and that's considered a misvad de oraita. Yet go around and look, and everybody's checking their watch and they're drinking till the last second. I don't know how they did that in olden days. How they know exactly when <laughs> when the last second was. Um, I, I guess they could see it when the sun hits the horizon. And you see that, no, and the rabbis don't say anything, even though that's a deoraita. They know that the people won't listen, right? They're all anxious and they want to eat some, eat, eat till the last second. So since the rabbis won't listen anyway, we don't tell them. And yet that's a deoraita. So this is really important principle 
um, and the conclusion here. This idea of adding to, to, uh, to uh, Yom Kippur it also applies to Shabbat. That's why we have candle lighting. You should add a few minutes to Shabbat. Um, this is um, usually considered a Deoraita a de to add some time, but in some sources it's a Deoraita, and actually it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls already, in the Damascus document. It's the first thing you should add. Oh. Not sure. Okay. Bechen isha mechabertah kikarot. Okay. Also, a woman can borrow now the next part of the Mishnah loaves of bread from another. Shabbat hu deasir alabachol shapir dame. So this implies that you can cannot borrow bread uh, on Shabbat, but that means during the week you're allowed to borrow bread and then you return it. Leim matnitin de la kihilel. This must argue with Hillel. Titnan, Vechena ya Hillel Homer. Lotta ve shakika la haberta, alcheta sena de mim. Shema, you keru hatin vim subaot, vide de bead. What's the problem of lending bread? Uh, the problem is that bread has a market price. Uh, think of it like gasoline now. You know, if I borrow a, a gallon of gas and now it's two, two dollars, then next week you come and return a gallon of gas, but it's worth three dollars. Oh, so now I gave you two dollars. I got back three dollars. That's charging interest, right? And uh, and you're not allowed. I'm not, you're not allowed to give it. I'm not allowed to take it. And so that is a is a big problem. So therefore, Hillel said you should always set the price. If you give me a gallon of gas, or in this case bread, you say I'm giving you two dollars worth of bread. So next week, when when I pay you back, then I'll pay you back two dollars worth of bread, even though that might mean half a loaf next week or pay the money, but it should be the monetary value. Okay, so you see Hillel thinks that you cannot simply loan, lend bread uh, without making the calculation first. And so he can, contradicts the Mishnah, which says that you can loan, lend bread uh, during the week. Uh, we'll reconcile it. Afilutema Hillel, ha-batsra de ka'ista dameha, ha-batsra de la ka'ista meha. We can reconcile it. Um, that our Mishnah uh, says it's allowed, would be talking about a place where there's no set price for bread. Uh, like now, you go to any store, there's different prices for bread, it's not a set market. Um, but if it was something like gasoline, where there is a set price, then in fact, it would be not, it would not be allowed, that would be charging interest. Okay, God, amino, if you don't trust the person, it's mad. Halva'at yom tov. Rav Yosef Amar, no niten alitaba, Rabba Amar, niten niten alitaba. In a case of mistrust, like what, what, what would happen if you end up coming and the person doesn't want to pay back? Can you bring someone to court uh, if, if they don't pay you back for something that you lent them on Yom Tov? Rav Yosef said, no, you can't. It's not an official loan. So you can't, you, you can't, you can't, you know, you just gave it to him. Rabbi says you can bring him to court. Rav Yosef, if you say that you can bring it to court, that means it's an official loan, and then you're going to come to right, right? So you have to you have to pick which one is it? Is it an official deal or not? If you say it is an official deal and you can bring it to court, then same as saying that you can write. Says no, you have to say that you could bring the person to court because otherwise, look at the effect that it's going to have. When I come to borrow some bread, you're going to say no, you're not going to lend me because you know you know you can't bring it to court, and then I'm not going to have bread, and I'm not going to have uh, happiness on the holiday. So therefore, it's really better for the sake of the holiday to allow people to. Uh, to borrow and claim their what they borrow in court, even though it does thereby, thereby look like it's an official uh, transaction, and therefore, yeah, more likely to uh, come to violate uh, writing on Yom Tov. Still, the the uh, the value of, of Simchat Yom Tov is greater. That's very interesting. Atenan im enoma amino maniachtalito eslo. Okay, we learned. Right, that you uh, you can kind of leave a collateral, not officially, but So we're going to test this out. We're going to test the two opinions we just had with this law. If you say that you cannot collect it in court, so that's why you 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 would leave a collateral to make sure that he pays because you can't collect it in court. But if you can. Bring it, bring him to court. My law. So why should we allow the person to leave a collateral? If you don't, even if you don't trust the person, so you'll bring him to court. 
Let him lend him whatever he's going to lend him, and then let him sue him if he doesn't pay back. Nobody wants to go to court. You've got to hire lawyers, you've got to pay the fees, it takes time. Uh, nobody wants to bother, right? You want a simpler solution, so you'd rather uh, put the collateral so you don't have to go to court in the first place. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, um, Mishnah, yeah, uh, someone who was, uh, who he wants to make a meal on Rosh Hashanah, so they go take a cow, and the butcher cuts it, and he gives it out to lots of people, um, and so they, they split it, but he can't, people they can't pay on that day, um, so they're going to pay back the butcher afterwards. Now, here's the thing, Rosh Hashanah was always, not always, was from the time of the Mishnah, was already two days, even in Israel. Right. If it's a Chodesh Mi'obad, if Elul, in other words, is really 30 days, that means that first day of Rosh Hashanah is really Elul. And now we're talking about a year of Shemitah. Shemitah kicks in on the Aleph Tishrei of Shemitah. So if the day when I borrowed that meat was the 30th, uh, 30th of Elul, if that was Rosh Hashanah, first day of Rosh Hashanah, then the next day, second day of Rosh Hashanah, is the first day of the new year, and all loans are canceled. I don't have to pay you back. Okay. But if it turns out that the previous year was Hased, and the first day is, uh, uh, the end of the day of Rosh Hashanah is in fact the first of Tishrei, then um, that since I borrowed on the first of Tishrei, if you, make, if you start a loan within the Shemitah year, it does not get canceled, then I would have to pay it back. Okay, that's Mishnah. Hold on. Why are you saying that uh, it would be Mishamet, right? If, if, I can't, if I can't collect it in court, so there's no point in saying, if, can I, then, I, then, I, then I can't collect it. I can never collect it, right? According to, uh, whose opinion was that? He said you can't collect it. Rav Yosef, right? He says you, can't, you can never collect it. So why do you have to say, in this case, I can't collect it? Uh, it's different in, the, in that case because, in fact, it was Chol. In other words, since that day was not really Rosh Hashanah, so it was a regular day. So a regular day, if I make a loan, it's an official loan. And therefore, I would be able to collect it in court. Because it says, not a Yom Tov, not a Yom Tov, it's an official loan. And that's why, in that case, you have to say Shemitah comes in and does it. It takes away the legal obligation or the legal collectability of a loan, but not the moral obligation to pay the loan back. Uh, well, that's another. You, even if you want, yeah, you can pay the loan if you want to. You can't go into court. What do you even care about Shemitah? No. Why would you say Miss Mishamet? You wouldn't say. No. No. Mishamet is a legal term. It only applies to real loans. Not. Not a nice thing to do. You can always give back if it's as a nice thing to do. Meshemet is a legal term. It only applies to legal, legal obligations. Okay. So we solved that. But what about to sefa, tashema mi sefa, im lav eno meshemet? If not, if in other words, if uh, the first day of Rosh Hashanah is in fact Aleph Tishrei, and so it's past the deadline, uh, then it does not get canceled. If you say that loans are, can be collected, loans are given on Yom Tov, that's why it makes sense. Since I can collect it, in this case, it was after the line, so um, it does not cancel. Shemitah does not cancel. Uh, but if you think that it cannot be collected in court, then Amai and Om Shemet. Why do you have to say it doesn't get canceled? There's no official loan here to begin with. Uh, the answer is the Yahib Shakil. It's just to teach that if you want to, if you want to pay, um, you can take it. And here, right, if you want to pay, he gives him the money, then he's allowed to, he's allowed to take it. Um, because it was after the Shemitah uh, began. So, uh, okay. Hold on. In the Resha, Yehib Le'el Shakil, 
So you're saying in the other case, uh, I can't take it, let's say even if it was before the deadline, and then, then you come to collect after the deadline. I'm still allowed to take it, aren't I? Not only difference is you have to say Meshamet Ani. So in general, if I lent you hundred dollars before Roshana, and then after Roshana you come and say, here, I want to pay you back. I, want, I say, I want to pay you back. Um, you have to first reject it, right? And, uh, and, but, and say, um, right, Meshamet Ani. No, I'm not, I'm not taking it, right? Uh, I relinquish my claim. If I say, no, still, even so, I want to pay back, not because I have to, but because I want to, then you're allowed to accept it. Um, so the difference between the cases would be, do I have to even say Meshamet Ani or not? Okay, good. Uh, so story, actual stories of people. Uh, he would he would take a collateral for the loan on Yom Tov, like the Mishnah said. Uh, the Baba would circumvent the whole problem. He didn't want to take it on Yom Tov, but he would wait till after the holiday was over and then take a uh, take something, take a collateral after Yom Tov, and that way he could uh, he could uh, uh, be more sure that the person would pay back whenever here whenever it came came. Uh, do. Uh, all right, so uh, we could talk about Pesach, but uh, okay, my, I think was asked to go. So why don't we end here and we'll continue from this point. Uh, Shabbat.